Awesome. And let everyone into the room. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Hey, Taylor. Nice to have hey, you. Hey, Ernest, good to see you. Oh, there he is. Hey, I was just, I didn't realize we we're all on. I was just about to say, let's go, Jacob. It's great to see you, man. Hi, you too. <laughs> yes, and you're also being recorded, uh, just so you know. Um, so it's FYI. still, it's still good to see him. <laughs> cool. Nice to see you, Narendra. Narendra. I did hear you there. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Okay. Well, I did turn on the recording. I'm just going to keep uh, letting people into the room, but uh, without too much further ado, I think uh, we should launch right into Founder Friday number three. Um, Foresight EIR Jacob Maltos has very kindly um, decided to, or offered to, decided to, offered to share his story with us, um, uh, a bit of his, his background, um, which I was really excited about because um, I personally found it totally fascinating. Uh, and it's actually pretty, pretty, uh, I, I I won't ruin it too much, but uh, I thought the I thought the descriptor did a really good job describing some of the incredibly unique challenges that the the business face, and some of them not so unique, uh, and that other businesses are probably going to face. Um, so really happy to have Jacob here as part of the network, and uh, yeah, I'll turn the mic over to him. All right, thanks so much, Taylor. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Thanks especially to uh, Foresight for creating this opportunity and for creating this community around clean tech and impact. In Canada, uh, this is a, a growing and exciting community. Uh, it's been so much fun for me to be a part of since way back in uh, 2007 when I left my job to become an entrepreneur and to start working in impact entrepreneurship in Canada and globally. And I'm excited to share some of the lessons learned from that uh, long and, and fun and challenging journey today. So this is the story of the .eco domain. I've kept it, as you can probably see from this slide, purposefully irreverent. So it's going to be kind of funny, informal. Um, I hope it'll generate questions. I hope you'll empathize with it at times. I hope you'll gain a deeper understanding for the technical world of the domain name system and also some of the various challenges that I faced uh, and my team faced along the road of, of building uh, .eco. So without further ado, uh, I'll get started. So I'm going to start just with a bit of a primer so you can understand what is this thing uh, that I built and how does it fit into the industry sectors? Uh, in, what is it as an industry sector? So what is a domain name registry? The whole domain name industry is run by a regulator called ICANN. Uh, and it is a mysterious nonprofit that was set up to manage the internet's domain name and IP addressing systems in the late 90s, early 2000s. You can think of it a little bit like um, the CRTC, like just like a spectrum allocator or the International Telecommunications Union, something like that. So it's a, it's a quasi regulator that essentially controls the market access to domain names. And its primary function is to ensure that you don't have duplicates of domain names, just like you wouldn't have two license plates uh, for the, you know, two of the same license plates on two different cars. You don't want... Uh, two of the same domain name existing on the internet. It's a unique identifier system. What's really interesting about how that works is that domain name registries, which are these domain name endings here, they're actually running under a contract with ICANN the right to sell all the domain names to the left of that dot. So if you control .com, you have the exclusive right to sell any .com domain anywhere in the world to anyone. So the contracts are potentially hugely uh, valuable. So some analogies here. We've often heard this described as if you get a registry contract, it's like getting a rezoning in the downtown core, right? So all of a sudden you have this license to build these condos and to sell those condos. You're essentially creating value out of thin air by building up. Or it's like wireless spectrum. You get a spectrum allocation, there's a big auction, there's a regulator, re regulator that controls it, but you win that and then you can sell access to that spectrum to your cell phone uh, as a cell phone provider, for example. Another analogy is pharmaceuticals. Again, huge regulatory challenges up front, but once you win, get like FDA approval in the States or approval in Canada, you essentially have a monopoly right to sell that uh, product. 
So these industries are common. They're all over the world. Uh, and they're very unique in terms of how they're structured and how the risks uh, and, and rewards are with them are associated. And we'll talk a bit about that today. Some of the nuts and bolts, it's a very good business. So if you own .eco, you sell example.eco or anything, you can sell either direct or via retailers. So what's a retailer? It's like a GoDaddy, right? Um, or web names or Hover. You probably know and heard a lot of these. These are the retailers. They're called registrars that actually interface uh, between the registries and the customer. So the average annual fee for a domain is about 20 bucks. CapEx is around $1 to $3 and renewal is 50 to 80%. So you can see that there's really strong margins and it's effectively an annuity business. Uh, understanding what makes a good domain name. So obviously the best domains are short and meaningful. Uh, Three-letter names, three-letter endings are the most valuable endings because they're the most globally compliant. Um, and then shorter, more meaningful domains, either generic search terms or specific terms for a company are the most valuable within the portfolio of a registry as an asset. So every 15 years or so, ICANN, the WISE, announces a great competition. It's a land rush, a call for new top-level domain registries. These are these endings. It takes years to define the rules of this game. There's a $200,000 application fee and a years-long competition after you win. Many people apply very few win, but if you win, uh, great riches await you. So who would do this? Who would take on this insanely hard feat? It kind of makes winning the Hunger Games look easy. Uh, unfortunately, that person was me. Um, so in 2007, I was working at ICANN. This is a picture of me at ICANN Morocco. Um, I don't remember exactly what was happening here, but this is one of the uh, competitions for new GTLDs. Just kidding, it was a local demonstration. Uh, local cultural demonstration. I had actually left uh, the UN Environment Program because I was fascinated by this whole world of ICANN and technology and global regulation uh, of technology that was emergent at the time. And I'm working at ICANN and everyone was focused on this new GTLD round way back in 2007, but it wasn't publicly announced. And I took a step back and said, oh my God, someone's going to get .eco. Someone's going to get it. And I literally am the only environmentalist on the planet that knows this is happening. And as an entrepreneur, many of you are probably entrepreneurs. You probably had these moments where you just feel like you've been struck by lightning and the idea will not go away. It is stuck in your head. And you're just like, if I don't do this, someone else is going to do it. I'm going to regret it for the rest of my life. How can I make this happen? What's going on? And then you decide to do something silly, like you quit your job. Um, and you start talking to other people and then, you know, investors and all those things. Um, and you're raising money. And then 2008, this is what happened to us. Uh, I started raising money in late 2007, 2008 was when we closed our seed round. And it was an incredibly difficult time. Many of you will remember uh, a couple of things happened. Uh, the main one was that uh, the financial markets completely froze up. Um, and let me tell you, this was a very challenging time to raise money. And we learned a couple of really important things here. One of them, and I, I always say this to any entrepreneur that I talk to, is when you're fundraising, ask three questions. Will you invest? If they say no, can you recommend anyone else who might invest? If they say no, can you help us improve our plan? And that mindset was really instructive for us during a really difficult time because it meant that every fundraising conversation we had was a success, no matter what. And I just, I can't emphasize that enough. It helped us kind of get through the slog of raising money during a really difficult economic environment. The other thing that I recommend, especially for Canadians, always shop overseas. So our seed investors, the first 50% of our seed round capital came from overseas, uh, US checks and UK checks, high net worth individuals. Um, the third thing was impact. And I think this is super relevant to Foresight. Companies were dropping like flies all around us. I had friends in the founder community that were like, we're done, everything blew up. This, the founder market, uh, the fundraising market in San Francisco completely stopped, dead. 
like everyone was done. Uh, and we didn't get cooked. And we didn't get cooked for two reasons, really. One, uh, our investors, even at this point, were in it for the long haul. And they were in it because they saw the impact and the potential of .eco as a thing. And I just can't stress this enough. The value of impact orientation for the resilience of your group, I experienced it and lived it. Literally, one of my found, uh, founding investors called me up and said, hey, hey, uh, are you going to uh, close the round? Because the S&P lost 10% today. Um, so that's the other piece of advice uh, here, which is close the damn round. Anything can happen while you're in that really crazy interstitial period. Don't worry too much about it. Get it closed. Um, and also, this is a hindsight point. You live longest with your first decisions. Really think about that structure. So close the round, but think about your structure because those decisions are really easy to make without thinking about it early on. And you can get stuck with them for the whole rest of the business, which is going to be for years. The other thing, and I'll come back to this, is crossover plays are challenging. So we were crossing over the environmental standards, green tech space, and the domain name space, which meant that we met a lot of investors that were experts in one of those spaces and very few that were experts in both. So we had to trust, those investors had to trust our expertise across both sectors because they themselves were usually experts in one of those sectors. And that made it hard uh, to convince them to get over the line. Uh, I don't have a good you know, solution for that. I just think if you're doing a crossover play, you're going to have to work extra hard to make that um, effective. So then we went into stealth mode. Um, we were waiting for ICANN to announce their application round. We were planning and doing quiet outreach to environmental organizations. We brought our burn rate way down. We were waiting in silence. We built something. And this is a fun little, it's kind of like our cloaking device. We built Ecolabel Index, which is a website that was a listing of all of the different environmental labels that existed. No one had built that at that time. It actually became um, a really nice side business and side revenue stream for us. And it allowed us to do a bunch of market research without going public about .eco being a thing. Now, here's the thing with hindsight, it doesn't actually buy you time to be in stealth and it doesn't save you from competition because it, just because you announce, don't announce your idea doesn't mean other people aren't thinking about the same thing. So really ask yourself, What's the benefit? Why am I in stealth mode really? Like, is it just my ego? I think in our case, it was a little bit just our ego actually. And I don't know that I would do it over again. So just think carefully about those decisions and what you're actually, why you actually need to do that. Because here's what happened. Um, this guy, his name is actually Fred Krueger. Um, gee, like you can't make this stuff up. He was a PhD mathematician, ties to the coal industry, had worked in uh, extractive industry hedge fund stuff. And he serviced on camera at ICANN Cairo in 2009 saying, hey, I really want to um, uh, do a .eco domain. I think I'm going to do this. It's going to be great. I'm super rich. And this guy was like the antithesis of an environmentalist. He had like private jets that he flew around in. He was actually po like posting on Twitter pictures of him in like business class Emirates as he was flying around to sell the .eco domain. We were like, oh my God, who is this guy? And we dismissed him initially. We were like, he's just a crazy rich guy who the environmental community is never going to pay attention to. We don't have to really worry about it. Except that he got the endorsement of Al Gore. Literally, the vice president of the United States and the founder of the environmental movement endorsed his bid. Uh, Al Gore clearly does not always do his homework in terms of who he's working with. Uh, Fred promised him 30% of the revenue from Dadico, and that was going to be a billion dollar enterprise. And we panicked and freaked out. We were like, oh my God, this is the end of our business. What are we going to do? Um, and we started talking to people and friends in the environmental community and talking to us and saying, geez, I really don't know how we're going to possibly survive uh, at this point. Like, is this kind of game over for us? Um, so we did the only thing we could do is we reacted with buttons. We went public. We said, we got to launch our bid. We have to be out there. We're not going to give up at this point. Um, we showed up at the ICANN meeting with um, some nice banners. We said, here we are. We're on alternative. Here's how we're doing this differently. Now, we did have, at this point, some critical endorsements. 
Uh, we had been talking to WWF. We had been talking to Green Cross. We've been talking to other folks. And they had kind of said to us, look, yes, you might be freaking out, but Al Gore is just one guy. And we are big institutions. And maybe this isn't a sprint. You know, this is a marathon. And let's just kind of see where this goes. And that was kind of interesting to us because we realized that there was actually still a negotiation going on between the community. And this is actually just the opening gambit. And now we're a part of this discussion, this debate. And what's that going to mean for us? And our strategy, and this is, again, a really important thing about leveraging community and how you leverage community for competitive advantage. So we invited the environmental community into our wheelhouse. We said, we know we can't do this without you guys. We can't win Dodico without you. We know that our competitors are not going to give you access to design their business model in the way that we can. And we see a couple of big trends. So B Corp is just launching at this time. The Global Impact Investing Network is launching. ESG is on the rise. Eco labels are becoming a dominant thing. The environmental community is getting into business at this time. And they want to learn more about how business works. And they want to learn more about technology works, how technology works. And this is absolutely I think this is one of the things that carries the day for us is that we came in deeply and honestly with the community. We said, we're not actually sure how to get Dadiko right. Work with us and help us figure out how to do it properly. And by creating that bridge and inviting them directly into the strategy discussions, we built trust. And when you build trust, you build resilience against what happened next to us, which is that we got attacked really aggressively. So they saw that our competitors saw that we had, we were building a freight train and over time, you know, the caffeine high of working with them was going to wear off. And all they had was this one play. Nice. You work with us, we'll give you money. That was it. They were done. Whereas we said, you work with us, we'll give you a say, right? And how this thing develops and evolves. Uh, and we really copped it. So they bought a PR campaign to actively trash talk us. We had paid trolls coming after us all the time. They had a Facebook site that went from 1,000 followers to 100,000 followers in two weeks. They were buying Indian um, Facebook followers, which is remarkably effective. Like almost everybody I talked to at this time thought that they really had that many followers. Nobody was doing do due diligence on those followers. They were buying celebrity supporters to try and dogpile more celebrity supporters on their model. It was really uh, intense and we learned a lot of things. Um, these are some of the headlines at the time. So actually what got spun up because we had Green Cross, which was founded by Mikhail Gorbachev. It was Gore versus Gorbachev, the battle for the Dodico domain, the new cold war for the Dodico domain name. It was all over the news, Gore versus Gorby. Um, they actually couriered a 17 page uh, kind of just attack on our business plan to the BBC. And this was actually a really interesting lesson in how that kind of stuff can backfire on you because the BBC reporter called us up and he said, I got this uh, thing couriered to me and it's kind of weird. Like, do you want to talk about it? Um, and so we were like, yeah, we had this interesting conversation back and forth. And he was like, oh, I get it. I see what's going on here. Um, and so we basically responded with one word. Uh, we thought the analysis was unfortunate. And it just kind of stopped it in its tracks. Like there's not much at that point. That was it. That's all we had to say. And it killed it. And the momentum from that campaign died. So these are some lessons from that PR battle, which lasted about, I would say, four months all in with a couple months on either side. You really have to decide whether you want to escalate. So there's some benefits to escalation, right? There's this theory, no coverage is bad coverage. It did get a huge amount of awareness for us. It actually opened some doors to some really high net worth individuals who later on endorsed and supported our work. Um, it's very difficult to sustain a PR attack. If you're on the attacking side, um, you need to just pour resources into that consistently and constantly to try and keep that up 
and the press and the media are going to want to see new events, new things all the time. So really think carefully before you embark on something like that. It's actually much easier to defend against it than it is to attack. We killed momentum with single word responses. They just didn't have much to hang their hat in on over that. Uh, we initially threw money at the problems. We hired like a high profile PR firm, actually ICANN's PR firm we hired um, to try and guide us through stuff. All we really got out of it was a couple introductions to journalists, which we could have built, frankly, through our own back and forth with journalists that was already happening. So I actually think that there's a risk when you're under in distress like this to just hire a really expensive PR and marketing firms that are going to burn down your cash we pretty quickly backed off of that, realizing we could build our own relationships with journal journalists, leverage our own awareness and tell our own story to kind of move through that. And actually you can do it pretty cheaply and effectively if you ever get uh, caught up in something like that. And then finally, really active communication with our partners. So we were on the phone with WWF uh, almost every day to talk them through that. And we got some great feedback and coaching from them. And it was a great opportunity to build trust with our channel and with our partners. Uh, so all in all, I think it was a, a net benefit for us to kind of go through this and kind of get this experience early on. Uh, and then we built momentum. So this is what I was talking about, about we established a council, we engaged independent mediation. So we had a third party actually negotiating between us to build a consensus around .eco um, and figure out a model that works for us. These are some photos from consultations we had around .eco uh, in Europe, in South Africa, in Brazil. So we really did this all around the world, left no stone unturned. We felt that we could not afford to have uh, people break to our competition for the cash. They didn't feel we were com uh, competitive or um, honest in the way we worked. But also, frankly, we just felt it was the right decision to do it. And it does take courage to let go. If you're running a business, the last thing you want to do is let go of your business plan. But sometimes it's what you need to do to build it properly. And so you just need to think about that. I think a lot of entrepreneurs get really caught up in their business plan. But the best business plans are kind of our business plan, right? Our being our customers, our being our investors, our being our community more broadly. If you really capture that hour, you can really capture a market. Uh, so this is a red slide. There's a couple more of these. This is an unexpected thing that happened. Yeah, even more unexpected than Al Gore. Um, the incumbent, Verisign, who runs .com, la launched a tax on the application round design process. So ICANN was initially going to launch on a particular year. And the incumbent launched a well-timed attack saying basically ICANN is going to destabilize the internet by introducing these new top level domains. And it delays us by a significant period, more than a year. And so we have to do a down round, basically. Uh, and this is really emotionally challenging. Any entrepreneur that's gone through this, you go, we, I went from a 30% stake myself to a 10% stake, you lose control. And I didn't realize at the time how significant uh, this is. And it's something to really think about and consider. Uh, and this is something, uh, if you're doing a venture, I would actually do it right at the start. Like as soon as you close your seed round or even before to say, what are my control knobs for losing control, right? Um, one of the things that I, with 2020 would have done is say, is my lead investor cash rich? Could they carry me through another round? Because if they can't and they're in control, they're not going to want to take dilution and they're not going to want to capitalize you again, right? So then you're in trouble. Are they a skilled investor in your vertical? Because now they're running the ship. You know, they'll say you're running the ship, but a lot of the critical decisions will still rest with them. So do they know your vertical super well? Do they have the expertise to support you? Are they coming forward to support you properly? Otherwise, it might be time to jump, right? So have a think about those when you go into those. Those are things that I wish I'd done differently with hindsight in terms of thinking about these rounds. Also, and I didn't put this here, but I'm thinking about it, just you still have leverage. Even if you're out of money, even if your investor is telling you they're going to eat you alive and take a big chunk of your stake, if you leave, they got nothing. They're done. So you should always come in and negotiate 
like you're not um, in a bad situation, even though it probably feels like you are when you're in it as the founder. So we did take advantage of that delay and we were able to win the support of over 50 plus environmental organizations. Um, I'm super proud of this. This is one of the largest environmental coalitions ever assembled, period. Uh, and you can still go to the ICANN website and see the letters of support. It was from the heads of the organizations, head of UN Environment Program, head of WWF, head of Greenpeace, organizations that don't even talk to each other. The World Business Council for Sustainable Development uh, and Greenpeace do not like one another, yet they both wrote letters of endorsement for our work. Uh, it was an incredibly deep and resilient uh, coalition that we built, and I'll tell you a little bit more about why we built that. Uh, on the left, there's a picture of our lucky money cat in front of the GTLD, GTLD application guidebook. Uh, that guidebook was about 200 pages long. The application we submitted was about 300 pages long. It was modeled on uh, an IPO process. So stress-tested financial models um, and business plans, all that kind of stuff, all submitted to the regulator on a deadline. And Al Gore gave up. So around about the time we applied, uh, we got an email from his right-hand man, his fixer. And he said, hey, it looks like you guys have some pretty serious momentum. Let's talk. And so... Uh, one of our investors, myself, um, and my co-founder met in Washington, D.C. with his fixer, and we basically agreed that they would have control over the messaging, that we would not say anything bad about them, that if they wanted to work with us, they could, and we would just very gently uh, move uh, move this to victory, which was an incredible uh, experience and again a demonstration of the momentum uh, piece and how you build that momentum with your community eventually uh, even what seems like uh, a situation that you cannot escape from and should be the end of your business uh, actually becomes a really good news story this is the second red slide um, the regulator got four times the expected applications so they expected 500 tld applications they got 2000 their system completely broke uh, and I mean completely. Nothing happened for like six months. Their CEO was fired. They had to bring on a new executive team. Uh, they actually had no sense of how they were going to process that many applications. This is a picture of their solution. They actually did a lottery. So everybody flew down to LA. They had a drum, which you can kind of see in the back there, where they were like rolling around. You had to buy a ticket for $100. And that lottery ticket would tell you in what order your application would be processed. And this was significant because it was estimated this time to take like two years to process all these applications, which is an insane amount of time. So we're just sitting there being like, what are we gonna get? What number do we get? We got 424, uh, which is not too bad at the end of the day. We found out also that we had uh, three, com three competitors. So Donuts, which is a big uh, new kind of applicant that emerged, they applied for about 200 top level domains. No sorry, 307 top level domains. They're called a portfolio applicant. We had a troll applicant over here. And then this was what the original uh, .eco applicant got folded into, Minds and Machines. Um, but we couldn't deal with any more down rounds. We're like, that's it. We have to deal with something. So, so we have to just eat this, which is kind of where the uh, eco label index model came in handy because we had kind of fashioned ourselves into these sustainability standards experts. And we ended up actually consulting our way through uh, this work to make payroll, which was great. And I think it's definitely something that's totally doable. You always have options like this. You don't have to just go out and raise money um, if you're pre revenue. Consulting worked for us, so it's a great option. And we were able to get through a delay without having uh, additional hits to our bottom line. You know, the other thing that happens um, during these periods, because it can kind of feel like, oh my God, this is just over and over, we're getting hit, is life happens and it's beautiful, you know? And this is a very emotional thing for me to just see these pictures here. But, you know, while I was building this business, my son was born, uh, I got married, my son was born after I got married. Um, 
but not too long after. Uh, and I got to spend a lot of wonderful time with friends and just experiencing and living life. And I think it's so important to just like not forget this, like all this wild stuff is happening and it can be totally all consuming while you're doing this startup and you just go like, oh, my life is over. I did this down round, you know, am I going to be somebody or am I going to be not or whatever? And you are somebody, you know, you're somebody in the eyes of your family, your friends, the things that matter. So just don't forget that as an entrepreneur. And you know what? We won in the end. And this is a really important thing in our strategy as well. We won with the support of our community. So most TLDs are awarded at auction to the highest bidder. Uh, but I can had actually built this special process where if you have a bunch of community support, you can beat out your auction competition. So now you see the other part of why it was so important for us to build community. The auctions were going for anywhere from five to $50 million for these TLDs. And it's really hard to raise that money if you're not in the industry. But because I can uh, is a community-based organization because the internet is a community-based network, they wanted to provide an avenue for groups like ours, like the environmental community to come in and actually uh, beat out other groups uh, by doing a community driven process. And we were one of very few groups to achieve this. So there were about 2000 applications for top level domains. There were about uh, 30 community applications and maybe 15 made it through this evaluation. No, maybe it was like 10. Very few made it through. And the evaluation process was extremely rigorous. It was run by the Economist Intelligence Unit. They called up every single organization that endorsed us. And you mind, mind you, this is two years after we applied. They get calls from the Economist Intelligence Unit saying, hey, uh, we heard you endorse this Stadico bid. You know, is that true? And 100% of the organizations that work with us said, yeah, these guys are great. We endorse them. They're the right ones. Um, and so that was an incredibly validating moment for us and just a reminder of the power of community uh, in building your organization. Here's the next red slide. So, and I think this is a really important thing to recognize when you have regulatory processes that have, let's say, untested things that happen within them or novel or innovative processes, they're often litigated. And lawfare is something that we discovered firsthand. Uh, all three of the losing Dideco applicants uh, effectively sued us. They went through an ICANN run arbitration, but it was effectively uh, a lawsuit against us. And they delayed us by a substantial amount of time uh, in doing this. And at the same time, they were calling us up and saying, hey, let's do a deal. We want to work with you guys. Like, you know, this arbitration is going to be so long. It's going to be terrible for you. Uh, let's do a deal. You know, let's work together. You know what? With hindsight, we kind of came in and we were like, no deal. We're going to just grind this down and we'll beat these guys because our burn rate was low. We had consulting on the side. We figure we can outlast them. They'll never, they'll never take us down. But we launched late as a result. By the time we launched, we did win. But by the time we launched, um, a bunch of other TLDs had launched before us and saturated the market. And I'll, I'll come to what the impacts of that were. And that wasn't something that we fully internalized at the time. And I think with hindsight, I actually would have done a deal with, with one or several of these bidders to pay them out to launch sooner because the cost um, to the business was significant. We were saved uh, by Van City. Uh, through this dark and terrible time, because we had the asset of the Dideco contract, we were able to do a debt round. And this is a really nice thing that opens up for you if you establish kind of funding based on tranches or milestones and you have an asset like a regulatory contract that has value. So the estimated value of the Dideco contract at this time was around 20 million bucks. And we were able to borrow against that. Again, thanks to being impact oriented, thanks to understanding, having an understanding banker in Van City who wanted to see a top level domain technology in Vancouver who had a good relationship with us, who cared about impact. Uh, and they helped us get through this and helped us launch uh, .eco. So again, impact kind of saved us. So 2017, uh, after a long wait, touche, .eco domains were rolling out. We built a team. 
we had a plan. We were marketing. That's a picture of me at one of the largest uh, uh, environmental uh, branding trade shows in the U.S. Uh, building out and launching uh, this incredible brand that was .eco. Um, and it was an amazing experience because in a short period of time, we had finished our legis- regulation. We had to launch as quickly as possible. And we had funding tied to milestones to actually make that happen. Uh, this black and white picture here uh, is a picture of Al Gore at dinner. And by pure coincidence, and I swear you can't make this stuff up, we were having our .eco victory dinner and at um, a small restaurant in Gastown with our founders and some close friends. And all of a sudden the restaurant started to empty out. And we're like, this is weird. Like we're the only people in here. And I looked down and I was like, I think that's Al Gore. And he was in town for the TED conference. And he had like booked out most of the restaurant for dinner. So there's actually me to the right of him going up to shake his hand and say, hey man, thanks for uh, bowing out at Eco. We're launching today. It's actually our dinner. And he was like, good for you guys. It's awesome. You know, make it happen. Um, it was just one of those weird moments in the journey of entrepreneurship that like, regardless of whether your business is successful, it's so great when funny stuff like that happens. It's kind of why I got into entrepreneurship to just like shake up, you just shake up your life in a really crazy way. Um, and fun stuff like that gets to happen. Um, here's Dadiko today. Um, it's an incredible company. It's built up great brands, uh, around the world. Um, but I do want to talk about some things we got right and some things we've got wrong. So what we got right when we launched, this is a picture of the launch day registrations as they were coming in uh, kind of on our internal live stream. Pioneering with industry leaders, that really helped because we had people we could hang our hats on, integrate into the marketing, say, yeah, these guys are using it. This adoption is real. We hired excellent dev and distribution teams. So we hired a distribution team that knew our vertical really well from the industry. Um, and our dev team built up a really amazing product uh, that was unique, but also um, aligned with the expectations of the community. And we stuck with our guns and our partnerships with the environmental community. Those were things that that really helped our business. Um, there are some big things that we got wrong, and I want to be super frank and open about this. Um, you must capture demand. This is a thing that I wish that I had stapled to my computer screen or stuck to my computer screen and should have guided all our decisions. So we chose not to do direct sales. We chose to sell through the channel. Um, I actually think that was a mistake because we also created a system that made distribution a little bit challenging, which is what I won't go too much into detail, but basically we had a validation process that allowed us to prevent people from, uh, publishing false or misleading environmental information on .eco domain websites, which is great because it managed misinformation and protected our brand, but the retailers didn't like it because it meant that we had a direct line to their customers. And so it created some noise. And if we had also had a direct sales channel, we could have built our own distribution up uh, to compensate for the challenges of onboarding retailers. So I think one of the lessons I took from this is if you're going to onboard uh, retailers, if you're wholesale onboarding retailers, you're playing their game. You can push them a little bit, but not too much. And you need to have your own um, distribution system if you're going to do anything too novel. We picked a high price point. Um, and we did that because we needed to, we were worried about two things. We were worried about the volume because we were launching late. We wanted to go slightly higher price and flat pricing. So not having lots of different premium domains. Um, You're not a special flower. You got to compete on price. Um, You need to compete on all levels. At this time, .xyz was selling domains for a dollar and our price point was $50, right? So 50X theirs. That was a mistake. With hindsight, I think our price point should have been lower. We probably could have got away with $20 and been competitive we still would have had huge margins, right? Channel is not marketing. So we balked. We had a marketing plan in place. We had a big marketing team. We were gearing up to spend 50K a month, just pushing out direct brand awareness uh, through our channel, but also directly. And we balked because we were like, this is too much burn. We can't do it. Let's try and push and leverage our community uh, channels for marketing. No, community is not, marketing community is like resilience community is 
um, channel sometimes, but it is not marketing. Don't make that mistake. You have to drop the cash on marketing and get the awareness, especially if you're going to be doing anything in the retail sector, which we were. So getting into the postmortem here, thanks for staying with me. I know it's been a long presentation. Um, this is our estimates on the left, and there's the actuals on the right. So many startups go through this, right? 2X our timeline, right? It was so intense, but we did launch. We made it happen. Uh, we got through with consultants, consulting, with loyalty, with a down round, um, and maybe some stubbornness that sometimes helps you and sometimes doesn't. So you got to know when stubbornness is good and when it's not. Um, you can see the differences in the size of the business here. And I want to talk to you about like what we did right and what we did wrong. And this is just like straight up honesty. Dot.eco launches in 2017, good bounce in the first year, flat in the second year. That's totally normal for this industry. And then it just kind of stays flat, right? Here we are at about 10,000 domains today, a little bit under 10,000 domains today. Here's dot art which launched around about the same time, channel-oriented domain. Similar kind of growth pattern, maybe slower at the start and then rising, but look at the numbers. 250,000 is where they're at. Like, holy smokes, way above where .eco was at, right? So this is what I get back to when I say, you know, and this is the value of our business right now, but this is where I get back to when I say, I'm just going to go back aside here, these three decisions to me were the difference between the size of business we built and the size of business we could have built, right? And so it's important to just recognize um, the constraints that are incumbent on the industry and how much ability you have to be novel with what you're doing. Um, so our present value is about 4.2 million. Contract value of win is 20 million. I actually think even with our present value of 4.2, we would still get 20 million for the contract value but you know, I'm an optimist. Um, our expected value originally, we were trying to build a $50 million business. I still think you could implement the changes on the business and build it into a $40 million business, but you know, it's my baby. Um, and closing note, if you're interested in launching a top level domain in 2026, I can will be launching another round of top level domains. So if you have a great idea for a top level domain and you're a glutton for punishment like I am, uh, it's coming up. I'm sure they'll stick to their timelines. Um, here's what I do now. I love to pay it forward uh, and help other entrepreneurs uh, learn from my mistakes. And also at the end of the day, I did build a successful business out of thin air. Uh, success is in the eye of the beholder. I love .ego. I think it's successful. I love the community around it. Uh, I try to focus my advisory work, uh, but obviously there was a lot of experience that I gained in doing this project. Competition strategy, channel development, regulatory risk management, founder mentorship and critical decisions. Uh, I'm an EIR for Foresight. I'm always available to help any Foresight entrepreneur. I loved working with Foresight. I still love working with Foresight, um, especially for founder conversations. Uh, I don't charge. Uh, that's just part of what I learned from being a founder. Uh, so many founders helped me along the way. So many investors helped me on, along the way. Um, and I never monetize that work. Uh, if you want to dig up, if you're in a PR struggle and you want someone to help you get through black hat stuff, and that's going to be a lot of work, yeah, then I'll charge. Um, but if you need someone to just talk to confidentially, who's been through almost everything, uh, I'm your man. All right. I'll leave it there, Taylor. Jacob, thank you so much. Wow. Uh, I can't tell you how much <clears throat> I enjoyed uh, and, and appreciate your presentation and just how um, how very much it captured the essence of what I, I want to create with these Friday sessions, um, which is uh, kind of paying it forward lessons learned from from the executives that have been there and uh, and and, you know, adding value to the founders that uh, that take foresight programs. And because this is a recorded session, it's going to be viewed by, um, you know, I think thousands of ventures over the next hundred years that will go through. Foresight yes, programs because that's what I believe foresight's. Uh, on a mission to create as well as is that community uh, around clean tech. So with that, I want to take some questions. Uh, does anyone have anything that they want to, to uh, hop off mute and, and ask Jacob? Would you do another domain registry, Jacob? <laughs> Would I do another domain registry? Okay, this is funny. 
Uh, I actually can't. Uh, and the reason is because my wife now works for ICANN, uh, which means that uh, as an employee of the regulator, her and she's actually working on the next application round. Uh, so I'm handcuffed. I will not be advising or working on any future new GTLD registries. Uh, but I still think it's a great business. Um, despite all the stuff that I went through, there are many successful GTLD registries out there and many people. Um, got it right and really right. Um, and it's a fascinating industry to be involved with. Wow. I have an idea, but I don't know that I want to put myself through uh, through that. <laughs> uh, because yeah, it seems like you're kind of like jumping right up into the big leagues, like from day one, like a lot of ventures only dream of being on this level of like, you know, Al Gore or celebrity endorsements and, th and things like that. Um, but you were there so quick. It's amazing. Just amazing. Did you ever actually meet Gorbachev? Funnily enough, no, I never met Gorbachev. Oh, I wish that I, I had know. met him. Yeah, yeah. Amazing to think that those organizations could publish that. Yeah, it was incredible how it got picked up. One of the things that we really noticed was that it was actually a very small, obscure blog that came up with the Gore versus Gorbachev Cold War thing. And a lot of journalists actually get their stories from these kind of niche sector blogs. And they just started copy pasting from that and it just completely blew up all over wow. the internet. It was amazing. Yeah. Wow. Fascinating. Any other questions? Andrew, please come on in. Oh, sorry, I uh, I muted you by accident there. No problem. Thank you so much for a, a wonderful talk. Um, I was wondering where you see the trend of uh, new registrants uh, coming from, like what sectors? Um, for profit, mm. nonprofit, um, textiles, uh, your clothing, um, food, like where, where are the trends going? Yeah, what a great question. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Look, what we really observe with Dot Eco is that, and a lot of people said to this, oh, if you can get Tesla to switch to a Dot Eco, oh, if you can get Company X to switch to a Dot Eco, you'll be made in the shade. The reality is they don't do that. There's so much invested in their domain name brand, once they pick it, like that's their thing. So what you have to do is go after the startup market. Um, it's the startups, it's the new businesses, the new entrants, where you're going to find people buying domain names. We often joke to Dadico, the first thing you do before you register a business, when you have a business idea is you buy the domain name. And like, I'm sure we've all had conversations be like, oh, I've got like 10 domain names for various business ideas that I bought that are just sitting on the shelf. That's one of the reasons we were so excited to start Dodigo is because we thought this is like the gateway drug for getting people hooked on impact. They buy the domain name and now we can start feeding them all the sauce about how they need to do disclosures and be honest and talk about their sustainability commitments and like start training people up. It was kind of like a, an actual like sustainability dojo. And so that's what I would look for. I would look for these high growth sectors with lots of new companies coming into them at a high rate. And then say, how do we leverage that, uh, leverage domain names as the thing you buy when you're first starting your business? And I'm hungry for education to learn more about how this business is going to operate. That's the key. And I think if you look at those and you run an analysis there, then you could really find um, where you would look for opportunities to start a new top level domain registry. Great. Thanks a lot. Well, I have a whole bunch of ideas for domain registries that I'm not going to share on this call because then I'd be giving them to everyone else. Stealth um, mode. Stealth mode. Yeah, that's the way we <laughs> learned. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess uh, if there are anyone else wants to to ask a question, then they're more than willing to come in. Um, otherwise, I'm probably going to uh, have a, a jumbled rooms for networking where everyone can can come on and get to know each other. So if you do not want to do any networking because you're camera shy. Um, I encourage you to uh, depart, but thank you so much for coming today to today's Founder Friday. And uh, yeah, the, we look forward. If you have a have a suggestion for a topic that you want to request, please let me know. Um, I can absolutely go out to the network and try and find speakers on that. But often, you know, we've got these wonderful EIRs who who support our startups um, and uh, and mentors and who have their stories to share. So uh, my goal is to keep kind of capturing those as much as I can. Uh, so yeah feel free to reach out. Looks like- Thank you very much. Uh, uh, 
Okay, uh, here, uh, my name is Edison. Uh, I have a question. May I still uh, ask them? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Edison. All right. Hi, Taylor. Uh, hi, Jacob. Thank you for your time. And Thanks. Uh, so we're, we're uh, climate adaptation data analytics. And so uh, where you brought up uh, the uh, having uh, in two sectors and uh, to talk to investors, they don't necessarily like understand each other's field. And we're kind of crossing uh, machine learning uh, data analytic and a climate uh, adaptation and also infrastructures. And mm -hmm. I would love to hear how you've navigated through getting fundings uh, by being in multi-disciplinary uh, 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 fields and how to uh, approach it. Thank you. Well, that's such a great question, Edison. Um, yeah, it can be really challenging because so many people talk about the opportunity of like crossing over industries, right? We're going to bring these two things together. It's going to be like chocolate and peanut butter. It's going to be amazing. And then you try and fundraise for your Reese's cup. And people are like, no, I only do chocolate, man. I know chocolate. I don't know peanut butter. What are you doing? So it's all about de-risking. If you got a chocolate guy, you need to de-risk peanut butter. You need to be like, okay, you don't understand machine learning, but we are partnered with like the best company on machine learning, or we have the most skilled devs on machine learning. Like, here's how we de-risk peanut butter for you. So you don't even need to think about it. And the same way on the other side, uh, you got a peanut butter guy, you need to do chocolate. So th that's what we did. We basically played them off against each other. We said, we have a technical partner, the environmental guys. We said, we have a technical partner who runs registries. They run the backend for .org. They're totally vetted. You don't need to worry about it. And then the other side, um, for the registry guys, we said, hey, look, we're working with WWF. We have uh, an angel investor who is one of the founders of um, Climate Change Capital. You know, he's a billionaire from uh, the UK. Like, we know this industry super well. I work for the UN Environment Program. You know, I know the industry super well. So not all of them are going to buy that, right? But it worked for us. Um, and it was ultimately, I think, the right strategy, just aggressively de-risk for the other party. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Said? Uh, yes, I have just one question. Sorry. Yes, thank you for your presentation. I really enjoyed and learned a lot. I see that uh, you had a lot of competitors also. And mm -hmm. you were working. You were working in a domain that it was not a virgin domain, it was not virgin territory. So it had, you had a lot of competitors, I see. And my question was about uh, this, uh, about these competitors. How you, at first, you I think you had to believe yourself. And how did you believe that you can compete uh, the, these competitors? And uh, because when you look at your competitors, you see that, okay, maybe they are working better than me or why there's a need for me to go this territory. So I am really yeah. interested to have your insight about this and you're in the competitor side. Thank you. Said, that's such a great question. I think it is an existential thing that all entrepreneurs carry, especially if they're in a competitive sector. I had, you know, friends take me aside and put their arm around me and be like, my <coughs> friend, you're a great guy, but what makes you think you can do this? You know, <laughs> when you're up against Al Gore, or when you're up against, you know, donuts that raised $500 million, like what makes you think that you can, can make this happen? Mm. And, um, look, you're never going to get rid of that doubt. You're going to carry it, right? And you're just going to have to own it and understand it. Um, I, we had a couple things going for us. Um, friends in the industry, right? So there, if you have other friends in the industry who are like, I think what you're doing is great, you mm -hmm. know? Gosh, that means a lot when somebody says that. And I really try to say that to other people now too, because I know, I know how much it meant to me. Right. So <laughs> you got to kind of, you got to kind of look for those people who are going to support you in a way and have that support mm -hmm. network around you. Um, I know that sounds cheesy, but like someone who will say, yeah, man, like you really know what you're doing. I think you can do this. Those big competitors, often they have things that you don't, right? Like they were focused on a lot of different problems, right? Like donuts was had right. 300 TLD applications. We were like a fruit fly. 
you know, that they were mm-hmm. like, right. Mm-hmm. And so, well, it looks to us like, holy crap, you know, like we're up against an elephant. It's hard for an elephant to kill a fruit fly. I know that sounds cheesy, but they really didn't pay that much attention to us after a couple of like short, sharp attacks. That was it. They were off doing something else. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and meanwhile, we were focused on building our niche, talking with our, you know, our channel all the time, building relationships. And this is again, where I think community is so important and building those friend relationships is so important. You might think that you're a small competitor or that you have a lot of aggressive, big competitors around you. Chances are they're not paying a lot of attention to you. You can build really good and deep relationships and you can move forward in a way that they can, you know, more quickly, more with more agility. They're probably one trick ponies a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. So just don't let, don't, a lot of people who are following from the outside will look at it and be like, oh, you're screwed, man. Like you're up against those guys. Like it's game over for you. But if you know your industry really deeply and you know those players and what they're focused on, mm-hmm. you can totally outmaneuver them. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Carolyn, I noticed you're off mute there. Did you have a question? Oh, sorry. That's okay. Man. Uh, oh, sorry. I didn't realize that. I'm just looking pensive and listening intently. Yeah, that's okay. Well, Jacob, I mean, I guess I will throw my ideas out there. You know, I was thinking, what if I got a huge association of media organizations <clears throat> to back a dot truth? Wow. Gosh, that's a great idea. Super cool. Yeah. I mean, this, these opportunities will exist, you know. Um, I think that the one of the things, just to opine on TLDs for a second, um, there hasn't been a lot of experimentation and innovation. I am surprised that there is no um, registry that leverages the domain name industry, domain name system, which is just a large database uh, for registries of carbon credits, for example, um, where you just type a combination of letters and numbers into the browser and it reveals your credit, you know, or your ticket or your certificate for anything like the DNS and certification, uh, has not been leveraged at all, which is mind boggling to me because getting back to your point, truth is one of the fundamental challenges facing the internet right now and how we link up internet technology with truth telling to create authenticity is I think a huge challenge and opportunity going forward. So yeah, I mean, those kinds of ideas are absolutely uh, fascinating. Well, I mean, that's the thing though, is I, I would imagine, say I had that idea, I would now have to go raise so much money in anticipation of, of competition. Mm-hmm. You know, that would be a fiercely competitive like, I guess, like, is there limitations on what you can put in there? Like, can you put anything? In? Yeah, or... I mean, I think it's zero to 63 characters long, so it can be pretty wow. massive. And there are all kinds of, you know, strategies around this. Like, one of the things that I had thought about was, you know, we should have applied for .eco and then, like, a .xyz, like, a, something that we knew nobody else was going to apply for. It's like a fail-safe, right? That we could have been like, ah, oh, the competition for that is too strong, but, you know, this other ending we could launch. So there's lots of ways that you can think about how you uh, engage in the application process and how you raise money in an effective stepped way. And this is something that I really learned about, you know, raising money in tranches based on milestones is a really effective way to manage regulatory risk. Um, Understanding how much capital you raise when is, is important, but lots of industries do this. I mean, it seems novel because it's like, Oh, I can, it's this weird, funny beast, but Getting back to my earlier slide, we do this in real estate, we do it in pharma, we do it in um, telecommunications, any sector where there's a regulatory um, inflection point, you can raise capital against that inflection point. And there are groups that do this um, all the time. Fascinating. Wow. Well, this is just like, yeah, such a treat. And, uh, you know, as like, not like, what a fascinating just tangent for for kind of on the on the eco side or on the sustainable for the sustainability community as well. Um, what do you think is holding back dot eco from?
becoming that that giant that uh, you know you saw Don Art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a great question. I mean, I think it just comes back to those three key points: um, pricing, distribution, um, are the key factors. And I think you know, if Dadico was to adjust and say we're going to sell direct, we're going to adjust our pricing, um, maybe we're going to start putting much more money into marketing, then you would see that that bump. Right. But yeah. I'm no longer in the driver's seat. Right. My co-founder still runs it. He's great. He's the one that and I think it's very easy to be, uh, let's see, to sit back and eat popcorn and oh, like yeah. watch the other yeah. person struggle yeah. with the day to day. Right. Um, but I do think it has that potential. And I think it's fundamentally this basis. I do some mentoring also with um, with a few other accelerators. And one of the things that keeps coming back is you have to own demand and like your whole business has to be geared to capturing demand and you cannot every time you make a decision to track away from that like my price point is going to increase or i'm going to add complexity on my user onboarding or whatever you are imposing a cost on your business and i think you see the output of that cost on the business in terms of the lower registration numbers for dot eco and that's just as simple as that i can certainly attest to, to losing my business as a result of signing with a distribution partner uh, so it's you tough, know. right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I have one more question. Maybe it's a simple question, but it's uh, for you know for the early startups. That's the, yeah, maybe important. Uh, my question about the revenue model that you had at the first, and uh, how did you update it? Uh, I'm sure that maybe you updated, but how f how far was the your starting revenue model with the the last revenue model? And mm -hmm. Consider if you want to come back to the first, which parameters you are considering that in the, your revenue model that you did you made a mistake at first maybe or looking there your when you when you now you look your revenue model what was the, your mistakes and also how did you obtain information about the, your uh, revenue model of your competitors how you want mm -hmm. to compete in these terms the, your competitors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is such a great question. Okay, so things we got right in the in the original financial model, uh, our OPEX, like our CAPEX, mm -hmm. we got right. CAPEX was pretty accurate to what we anticipated. Um, our renewal rate, so the rate at which the product is a SaaS business, basically, right. so the renewal rate, uh, we got right. Those are two big things that we got right. Um, uh, our What we got wrong was we changed our price. And I, again, I come back to this. So we, we, our original model, like our price point was going to be around 20 to $25 mm -hmm. wholesale. So um, shooting for that retail around like $40, you know, uh, I think it was still too high. Like, I think we should have gone, we, 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 we overestimated the price, mm -hmm. the volume that we would generate at that price point. Right? right. And then we didn't correct. So what I think with hindsight, again, we should have seen in the first couple months, we're like, we're not generating the registrations that we expected at the price point that we picked. We need to <laughs> chop that price point right away. And we, we didn't do that. Right. So that was a big factor for us. Right. Um, and I think the other thing that happened in the financial model, which I didn't get too much into the presentation, but which is quite critical a major effect of us launching late was that the market became more saturated than we were anticipating, which meant right. that when we launched, we didn't get the bump of initial registrations wasn't as large as we had mm -hmm. hoped. And so our initial model, the financial model was we're going to take that bump. The, it's called a land rush in the industry. We're going to take that bump from launch and then we're going to plow all that money back into marketing. And we budgeted to get about a million bucks from the launch and we were going to punch all that back into marketing and then that was going to drive revenue growth now what happened was we got about 40 percent of that oh. so like four hundred thousand, right and so we still put that into marketing but it wasn't enough because actually launching late meant that we probably needed two million dollars right instead of a million dollars which we so we ended up with four hundred thousand. we probably needed two million that's a big <laughs> spread right exactly yeah. And so at that point we said, okay, uh, we need to get marketing dollars. Let's go do a round. Like, and, and there was just a split amongst investors and the founders 
because that would have meant raising money at a lower valuation. I probably would have gone from 10% to say 5% and the lead investor would have lost control. But my theory was, this is a difference between a $10 million business and a $50 million business. We have to do it. I'd rather have, like, I'll mm -hmm. still double my money if I go from 10 to 50, even at half, even at 50% dilution, the math still works. I'm fine. Lead investor did not want to give up control. They were like, nope, we're going to, we're happy to just truck along. It's important, more important for us to keep control than it is for us to have a big business. Um, try to build the business without having any more money. And we can see how that works. It didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Because you must capture demand, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't, does that does that help with your question? I think it's a big thing to think about, like especially with pricing. Like we really underestimated, I think, the impact of of pricing and timing. I'm just gonna mm -hmm. take off mute here and uh, and then say you can tell us a little bit about your or record.